God has been putting it on me the last couple of days to do a video on or a study on uh, a kingdom and so that we can understand what the kingdom of heaven is. So we're going to take a look at what he established of a kingdom and what he said regarding the kingdom of heaven. The word uh, used for kingdom in the, in the scriptures is memlaka, and it's a Hebrew word. The outline of biblical usage is kingdom, dominion, reign, sovereignty. So kingdom, dominion, reign, and sovereignty. Now let's take, take a look at the best part, which is how God used it in a sentence, because that's really what's going to give us a sense of God's heart. Now he refers to us in many different ways, right? Just like he has different names to represent him, to represent the name, which is his cause and his will and his purpose and his reason. And just like with, you know, with his people, the people he's chosen, he calls them a nation. He calls them a city, the city of Jerusalem, the nation of Israel, Mount Zion, a temple, living stones in a temple. He calls us a body and he calls us a kingdom. And so all of this is giving us different aspects of his heart because one construct does not help us to understand just a kingdom alone does not help us to understand we need to understand what is a temple what is a body what is a in order to understand the way that we function and what we mean to him and what we mean to his will his cause and his reason genesis 10 10 in the beginning of his kingdom was babel and eric and akkad and Calne in the land of Shinar. Genesis 20 verse 9, Then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, What hast thou done to us? And what have I offended thee, that thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. Exodus 19 6, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. All right, so that's the first time he refers to us as a kingdom. There's only two times where kingdom is mentioned, or at least this particular word is mentioned in scripture, and that's Genesis 10, 10, and also Genesis 20, verse 9. We want to understand a little bit more about this because we have our own idea of what a kingdom is. So let's look at the context. We'll start in Genesis 10, 10. Okay, so as we're looking at Genesis, it begin, you know, the chapter begins at verse 1. As we look at verse 1, it says, now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood, the sons of Japheth, Gomer, and Magog, and Medai, and Javan, and Tabal, and Meshech, and Tyrus, goes into this lineage. Then in verse 5, it says, by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue. His tongue, what's his tongue? His language. That's all a tongue is. That's all the gift of tongues is, is to speak a language or language is. Divided into their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families in their nations. And the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mizraim, and Phut, and Canaan. And the sons of Cush, Seba, and Havilah, and Sabta, and Rama and Sabteca, and the sons of Rama, Sheba, and Dedan. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore, it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom, so the beginning of Nimrod's kingdom, was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Calne in the land of Shinar. So it says something very interesting here. And, in the, be and the beginning of his kingdom was, and then it goes into these different names. We're wanting to add to the kingdom. We're wanting to build the kingdom for God. And that's why that language is used. Let's look at the second context. It's also in Genesis first, uh, chapter 20, verse 9. So let's go ahead and look at this chapter. Verse 1, and Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of, his, of, his, of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister and Abimelech king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. Okay, so we know this story. We know that Abimelech finds out that Sarah is actually uh, Abraham's wife. And because God comes to Abimelech in a dream at night, and he tells him, basically, you're a dead man, because you took a married woman. Then by verse eight, it says, therefore, Abimelech rose early in the morning and called his servants and told all these things in their ears. And the men were sore afraid. Okay, so Abimelech has servants in this kingdom. Then Abimelech said to Ab called Abraham and said to him, 
what hast thou done to us? And what have I offended thee that thou hast brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. So, so far, we know that we, we understand that there is a beginning of the kingdom. There is a continued building of that kingdom. And there are servants in that kingdom. This is a stratified kingdom. A kingdom is stratified. So by this time in Exodus 19, that's what they understand about a kingdom. There's a king and there's servants and you continue to grow that kingdom. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. So this is a holy kingdom and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Ooh, let's look at that. Let's see what he's supposed to speak. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud and the people may hear that the people may hear when I speak with thee and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. Well, actually we have to back up a little bit in order to see what the Lord said. I was getting going forward. So in the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai for they were departed from Rephidim and were to cut, were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up to God and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain saying, thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel, ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles wings and brought you unto myself. It's a pretty powerful statement. Every time I read that, I feel the significance of it. Do you? Let me read it again. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. Now, what did he do unto the Egyptians? You remember, killed the firstborn of every household. He put plagues on them. He sent, um, he sent all kinds of stuff on them. Then killed the firstborn of every Egyptian household. And then he, of those who were chasing his people and trying to bring them back into bondage, what did he do? He parted the Red Sea so his people could pass through, and then he closed up the Red Sea and snuffed their enemies out like a wick. What do you think he's going to do to your enemies? What do you think he's going to do to those he has redeemed and called and chosen to himself when their enemies try to chase them down and return them back to bondage? It's going to be bad news bears for those guys. You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Okay, so he's called a nation to himself. He's called children to himself. He's caring and looking after them as his children, hovering over them in a cloud and then warming them at night by fire. And how special is that? Because that was, that was God's presence there. So this kingdom, you know, not necessarily in every kingdom and government do the leaders care, right? You know that well, don't you? Most of the time they're taking everything for themselves, right? That's how human leaders, we were never supposed to desire a human king, were we? At the end of the day, there's only one who cares for us, who truly cares for us. And if we don't have him, we don't have anything. And you see later on in scripture that these children that he called to himself chose a human king. That's what they wanted. We want to conform to the nations. We don't want your prophets. We don't want to hear the word of the Lord. We want a human king. And why did he oblige them? Is it because he was throwing them a bone? Is it because God can be tempted by evil? No, because God's doing something. He's representing something. What do you see today? Do you see people chasing after human kings and not understanding who their king is, calling themselves Christian, 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 even while idolizing those human leaders. It's come full circle and that's by intention because you're going to have to make your decision that these things were done as an example to you. You're going to have to make your decision as to whom you place your trust in. On whom are you relying? A human king or God. And don't say a human king because God has anointed that person. That is not, that's a total manipulation of scripture. God does not yield his praise or glory to idols. We're supposed to understand that God is the one who appoints 
the rule, the, the, the spirit that's going to rule over us. So that when we start seeing that the spirit that is ruling over us in these human leaders, hum, human kings is not so good, we need to return to God. But we, where do we place our trust? Go vote. Then we get mad when there's election interference, right? God's going to win at the end of the day. His will is always going to be done. We are never going to bypass his will. Okay, so is this kingdom inclusive or is it exclusive? Because I didn't hear him say everybody's welcome. I didn't hear him, you know, posting on his marquee outside of a counterfeit church saying rainbow, 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 love, 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 all sinners welcome. Yes, God came here for the sinners, but that didn't mean what they're making it out to be right now. Because really what they're saying is all sin is welcome as long as you bring your checkbook. If they were concerned about sinners, then they would be concerned also about leading those sinners to repentance and teaching them about their covenant rather than preaching this lie that Jesus paid it all anyway. No worries. Just, you know, wait out your time for the pre-trib rapture. Lies, lies, lies. Exclusive, God set apart one nation and don't go saying, oh, the Jews are his chosen people. Don't start saying that. That's counterfeit doctrine. God has not chosen people by ethnicity, and Scripture clearly indicates that. Scripture tells us that not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Not all who are descended from Abraham are Abraham's children. Not everyone who is a Jew outwardly is one inwardly. But a Jew is one who is one inwardly through circumcision of the heart. So we need not lean on our own understanding. But why is it that God started with one nation and then all the other nations? Because what he was showing us was how small a people he has chosen to himself, that small remnant. And then he told that remnant, you are not to become like any of these other nations around you. You see how small you are? You don't become, you don't conform to the norm. And what do they do in science? What do they do in research? Everything that is normative, everything that is most frequently occurring in the population is called normal, and that's set up as a good thing, bad for good and good for bad, right? But you know that what is normative, you know according to scripture that what is normative in these last days is not good. Please think about that. Please think about that next time you want to belong. Please think about that next time you're looking for a congregation and you look at our little assembly and you're like, ah, but there's not a lot of you and we're not meeting in person. And secretly, I kind of enjoy, you know, hanging out in a congregation where I can kind of hide out and no one really knows me and I'm not participating in my covenant. And I can idolize a pastor at a pulpit preaching some counterfeit message. And I can convince myself that I'm somehow under the covenant because of what he's doing. Please think about that. You need to understand that if you want to be in this kingdom, you are going to have to unlearn everything that you think you know, everything you think you learned from counterfeit Christianity. Just throw it all out the window and whatever God knows needs to come back, then he will bring it back. Please understand that if you are not, if God's kingdom is not normative, then everything that you have learned in your life up to this point is probably a lie, especially if you didn't read it from the word, if you weren't being taught by God's spirit himself. And you're going to have to get comfortable with not being like everyone else, with not looking like everyone else, with not having the same deeds or thoughts or the way you speak. You're going to have to get comfortable with the idea that people are going to reject you for no good reason. Like you won't even have a falling out with them. They're just going to reject you because of the spirit that's living through you. Up until this point, you have to question why it is that the world has accepted you because the world does not accept me, but the world accepted me when I was a counterfeit Christian. The world accepted me when I was saying, yeah, I'm a Christian, but you know, all we're all talking about the same God. All religions lead to the same God. No, they don't. There is only one gospel and that is the only gospel that will save. And it's written in the Bible, not at a pulpit, not on YouTube. Numbers 32, 33. And Moses gave unto them, even to the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben and unto half the tribe of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, the kingdom of Sihon, king of the Amorites and the kingdom of Og, king of Bashan, the land with the cities thereof in the coasts, even the cities of the country round about. Okay, you know what this reminds me of? What it reminds me of is anything that you're praying in his name, he's going to give you. And his name being his cause, his reason, his will. And so likewise, if you are children of God, 
does it not, like, if you have your own children or you have children who are close to you or nieces, nephews, whatever, when you're giving to your own, it's not like some huge burden or something. I mean, if you're giving to your own, it brings you joy. There's a return on on your investment in your own children, isn't there? And similarly, when you're praying in God's name, in his will and his purpose, of course he's going to give you what you want because you have taken the time to consider what's important to his heart and to rend your heart to what's important to his heart, which isn't always easy, by the way. I've been praying for someone who's nasty to me and God keeps moving me to pray for him. And this person is outright nasty. He keeps bringing me back. And, and you know, like I, I start to go, or I started to maybe about a week ago when he first started putting this on my heart, um, I started to think, well, how do I pray for him and really mean it? Because I know that my empty prayers are nothing. They're not going to be to my credit. I need to forgive in my heart and I need to really want these things for him. And so he started having me, you know, rend my heart to, well, what is his will? What is his purpose? What is his reason? And really wanting this for him. Well, the same thing goes for giving you gifts. Um, Those gifts are used for the kingdom of heaven. No, those gifts are not for you to just go babble around. Those gifts are used for the kingdom of heaven, for his name, for his will, and anything else that he's giving to his children are, he created us for his good pleasure. So it is a pleasure to give to his children, to give good gifts to his children, right? And so, especially at this time in history, while we're going through all of this hardship and we're, you know, contending with evil people and their evil practices and this life is hard. I've had a really hard day today. And I, I can't wait to get out of here. I gotta tell you, I cannot wait to get out of this world and just to be done with all of this. But we have to remember that God's got good plans for us. He's got a future for us and that what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no one could have fathomed, God has amazing plans for us. But we have to endure till the end, don't we? And... Part of that endurance is living as priests, as priests who are holy, a holy nation to him. Well, guess what? Priests in God's kingdom have a role. They have a function. They don't just sit around on their rear ends waiting for God to show up. They endure. They learn. They receive his ministry. They are led by him and moved by him to follow his laws and keep his decrees. They understand that the word has told them from the very beginning that they must become holy as God is holy. And I don't see how anyone could sit on their rear end and do nothing because that's a really high bar. Deuteronomy 3, 4. And we took all his cities at that time. There was not a city which we took not from them. Three score cities, all the region of Argob, the kingdom of Og in Bashan. Has God promised us that we're going to plunder our enemies? But again... Right now, our enemies are plundering us. When the Antichrist rises, oh boy, our enemies will be plundering. Again, it's the joy that's set before us. The joy that we feel right now, what were the apostles rejoicing in? They were rejoicing in being persecuted and being deemed worthy to be persecuted for the name. I mean, that is a totally different definition of joy and rejoicing than what the world talks about. Again, Deuteronomy 3 verse 21, and I commanded Joshua at that time saying, thine eyes have seen all that the Lord your God hath done unto these two kings. So shall the Lord do unto all the kingdoms whither thou passest. Okay, so God's the one who sets up kings. He's also the one who deposes them and he gets to give them, give those kingdoms to whoever he wants. You learned that lesson with King Nebuchadnezzar, didn't you? That was exactly what Daniel told King Nebuchadnezzar. And you saw what happened to him when he uh, didn't give God the glory. He was forced for seven years to live in the wilderness like like a wild animal and eat Uh, grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven, covered in hair with claws. It doesn't sound like a pretty sight. For seven years until he acknowledged God. Deuteronomy 17, 18, and it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests of the Levites. So there's a kingdom and there's a throne of the kingdom. And we see that again in Revelation when we see the throne room of God, right? 
that there are thrones of honor for, first of all, for King Jesus. And then there are 24 thrones for the witnesses and for the apostles. Deuteronomy 17, 20, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren and that he not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Okay, so there are statutes that God has laid out. There's also this language of prolonging his days in the kingdom. Like basically God is the one who sets up kings. God is the one who deposes them. And also God is the one who numbers your days in whatever role you're in. Deuteronomy 28, 25, the Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go one way against them and flee seven ways before them and shalt be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. Deuteronomy 28 is an extremely important chapter. So if you're not familiar with it, please read it because it really talks about this covenant. God's heart has not changed. You know, he's not a man that he should lie. So he doesn't like establish statutes and then like later on in the Bible say, eh, never mind, just kidding. As though something has changed in his heart. He's not fickle. And as a matter of fact, Jesus has said that not a single thing is going to be abolished from the law. Everything that God has established here, it stands unless it's been fulfilled. And let me tell you what fulfilled means. There are some things that we no longer practice, such as sacrifice, because Jesus completed sacrifice, but that doesn't abolish his holy days. We're still to observe his holy days in remembrance of, and as a matter of fact, when he commanded those holy days, some of those things had already been fulfilled, such as Passover, at least the first Passover. But another part of that fulfillment is actually Jesus adding to our understanding. You've heard it said an eye for an eye, but he adds this command to love. I want you to pray for your enemies. I want you to give to those who ask of you. I want you to turn the other cheek when they slap you. That's a fulfillment. So here in Deuteronomy 28, 25, he's saying, the Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go one way, excuse me, go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. So he's going to humiliate people in front of them and then shall be removed into all the kingdoms of, of the earth. What is he saying? Kind of like when he says they're going to be scattered and lost in all these kingdoms of the earth, in all the nations of the earth. And then he's going to pull his people back out, right? And this is being spoken of within the context of punishment. Let me tell you something. When you are in God's kingdom, there is so much safety and security and peace and a sense of belonging that, you know, a lot of us chase in the world, which is part of the reason I try to get you to come to assembly and experience that blessing. I mean, first of all, it's a blessing. Second of all, it's required. It is required in your covenant to assemble even more as you see the day approaching. But what has happened? What's happened as we've been scattered and lost and wandering through these other nations that are not God, that are of the world. Have you become so aware of how badly you need to get out of there, of how you don't belong in these other nations in the world? You don't feel right, do you? You feel like a foreigner. So that when we come together in Sabbath, I mean, listen, we have about I don't know, 15 regular people. And, and there, there have been more that have been uh, adding to the group. And I'm so excited about that. Um, but there, the, the regular people that come to Sabbath and workshop and Bible study, they can't get enough. I mean, we love it. We love coming together. There is a genuine love between us. And we're trudging this thing. And we're getting it. And we're being moved by God. And we're supporting each other through the grief. Because there's a lot of grief. I mean, if you're in God, you're going to be grieving and you're going to be suffering. And I would say that it's impossible for you to be in Christ and not feeling the grief of the Holy Spirit. I mean, how many people do you know that are actually in him? Quite frankly, I know only those who are in the assembly. They are the only ones I can vouch for. I see the fruit. I hear what they're sharing. And I see them actively engaged in their covenant. I can't speak for anyone else because if I don't see the fruit of obedience to what God ha requires, what's a YouTube video going to do for you? Nothing. Faith without works is dead. Faith without obedience is dead. So God has established his kingdom where there's safety and there's a, 
you know, there's a king who's watching over us. And then he's established these kingdoms of the world because you know what? He creates the light and the darkness. He does all these things, not just the good. He has created the, he has created evil as well. And why has he done that? In order to give us a choice, in order to give us a choice and test us as to what decision we're going to make. Do not become conformed to the pattern of the world. Do not become conformed to the pattern of these kingdoms. Do not place your trust in those kings. That's been the message of God for a long, long time. I don't care what's normative. What's normative was killing me. How about you? I mean, the word tells me that we were dead when he called us to himself. We had to cross over into life. There's another context here in Joshua, um, and the word royal is used in the same context of, of this word, memlaka. So the context is jo- uh, Joshua 10 two, that they feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city as one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all the men thereof were mighty. That's interesting. So royal cities is, uh, or technically the word royal, is used interchangeably with kingdoms or this word mamlaka. And he also refers to us as a royal city, right, of Jerusalem. Okay, so I think we understand what a kingdom is. It's something that's building. It's royal. So there's certain authority and power in that kingdom. And yet only under the sovereignty of God, God's kingdom is exclusive. The world's kingdoms are inclusive as long as you're evil. Otherwise, you're just going to be chewed up and spit out, quite frankly. Kingdoms are always trying to build. They're always wanting to build. We definitely see that pattern in uh, in God's kingdom. You know, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, remember? And it grows into that tree. And then all the birds are perching in the branches. And God definitely makes this distinction between his kingdom being good, being, you know, caring for his people, Um, Even in the very beginning, remember we talked about the children of Israel caring for us as his children. And then you hear this distinction, like such as in 1 Samuel 10, 18, in which he says, um, and said unto the children of Israel, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all kingdoms and of them that oppressed you. So there's a clear distinction that this is that these kingdoms are evil. And then 1 Samuel 13, 13, Samuel says to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. So we take that example. We take the example of um, King Nebuchadnezzar, for example. And we understand that Again, God is the one who sets up kings. He's the one who deposes them. He's the one who has set a standard on how they must be or everything they have will be stripped from them. What does he say? And given to another. And what does he say about the the world's important people? Those who are important here in this world are far from being important in the kingdom of heaven. Those who are first will be last and those who are last will be first. I think I'm going to pause here. I've had a really long day today and I don't want to just kind of push through the material, especially since God's been putting this on me for a couple days. So I'm just going to stop here. I think that's a good, um, a good beginning uh, sort of study of kingdoms in the Bible. And tomorrow we can move into taking what God established in the Old Testament and understanding his kingdom with his people in the New Testament. Thank you for listening. I look forward to our study tomorrow.